All right. Welcome back to Friends in Austin. Today, I've got Jeremy Robinson on the podcast. And Jeremy, we met, it was a long time ago. I met you pretty early on when I came to Austin um, through like Jeff and Cliff and Leslie. I haven't talked to Cliff and Leslie in a while. Have you? I haven't in a while. Yeah. Hope yeah. they're good. Yeah. Same. Yeah. It's been a, it's been a good ride, man. Yeah. They all have, both have a lot of stories to tell and growth from our experiences from when we first knew each other. Yeah. And actually I don't really know your like total full story. So this will be good because I won't have to make up any questions or anything like that. Um, so I know that you are definitely into fitness and you had, had your own gym. I, I did see on Facebook that you ended up closing it due to COVID, I assume. Something like that. Um, I guess a good way to start for me to kind of understand a bit about telling my story is kind of knowing what was your perspective? Like when you first met me, what did you think I was doing? Or what did you kind of gather from our hanging out together that I did that I was doing? God, that, that was like six years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I knew it was something to do with fitness or personal training, I thought. Mm -hmm. That's all I really knew. So six years ago, I was actually right at the, the tail end of exiting a, a, a teacher spot. So I was working at a tech school, and I was teaching anatomy and physiology, kinesiology, biomechanics, and some physics. And that created a situation where um, that school decided to, you know, end. Um, it ran out of its funding. I don't really know exactly what happened, but I became the fitness director for that, that school. And then the uh, gym that I was actually, that was part of the school that I was teaching out of as well, like using that gym, I bought all the equipment. Oh, cool. And then I needed a job. Yeah. So... I'd already come before that as a gym owner uh, with, a, with a guy over in College Station and then moved to Austin and then it's been a long path of moving from San Marcos, Kyle, Buda, just moving my way up to Austin. Became, Are you from Texas then? I'm from Mississippi. Oh, okay. So it's been a, I moved here when I was 15. Mm -hmm. Damn. So did your parents move here then? They did, but they moved back whenever I went to college because uh, the taxes are better. Where did you go to college at? At Sam Houston State. Okay. And then graduated. I mean, it's been a it's been a good ride. Mm -hmm. And then creating that space where I needed a job, my entrepreneurship just kind of kicked into into overdrive because I needed a job. <laughs> yeah. And so the school ended and and then it was like, do I change my identity and go fully into like getting a job somewhere, uh, working at some kind of health field and filling out applications, or do I just do my own thing? So Got a loan, created a space within 30 days. I had a gym called 10RM Fitness, and that's where you met me was when I was doing that, that gym space. Mm -hmm. How, how um, worried were you about getting a loan and opening that gym and like your confidence in getting clients in there and being able to pay that loan off? I just really just ran with it. Mm -hmm. You're just like, hopefully it works out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like if, if I do this, I've just, it felt so right. Because I bought like uh, probably about a hundred thousand dollars of equipment for like eight grand, mm -hmm. and I was like, no matter what, like I do from here, even with the loan, if I sell this equipment, I'm coming. Like it's a win-win, no matter what happens here. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. So if you got the equipment, you you can sell it if you have to. It, yeah, and I could pay back the loan. So all the numbers made sense to just give it a run. And I had enough to be able to survive for three months. And then within that three months, I just went out to every single space I could for small business meetings and meeting people and growing and learning the community and learning the people around me. And then it kind of took off. How did you get all that equipment in there? Did you just call some friends and start hauling it in there or what? Me and one friend moved all that <laughs> out of a tiny door. I don't even know how they got it really in there. We barely got it out mm -hmm. and moved it all out and then moved it all in. And then I did a lot of it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I put all the flooring down, put all the equipment together. I had some friends that were helping me kind of put, but they got exhausted because it was a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's been, gosh, probably eight days until three o'clock in the morning every day. Just mm -hmm. putting everything together and setting it all up. And so did you rent the space to, yeah. Yeah, to put the equipment? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was an easy, an easy rent over off uh, of 71 South Austin mm -hmm. and Ben White and uh, Congress. So the location was just 
sounded perfect Mm -hmm. because it actually sounds like like oh i'm at ben white in congress that's like two really well-known intersections yeah it was really easy for people to conceptualize that it was important Mm -hmm. they didn't have to think about where it was and that really actually helped a lot that makes sense so then when you got all the stuff in there you got the space how did you go about getting people in there just word of mouth yeah just being charismatic charismatic and just talking to people and letting them to kind of know that I existed and that I do a good job and the gym is clean and you can get a high quality space where you're going to learn. Were you just cleaning it yourself? Oh, uh, cleaning it? Yeah. Were you just cleaning your, cleaning oh it? no, I had, you had people, I, cleaning yeah, I had it. people and I had employees. I had trainers that would come and use the space and I'd trade them a month or so of like rent to do daily cleanings and, you know, mm-hmm. just the basic things to really alleviate my own work in that in that aspect yeah did you also do training out of there yourself that you would charge for or did you just live off the gym yeah that that's actually what brings me to the next like the transition of that gym was essentially three years of awesome learning and understanding of being able to sell the memberships and retain you know all the aspects of owning a gym are just that member retention and understanding people and what they're going to spend their money on and then realizing that I did a lot of the training. Mm-hmm. And so since I was doing so much of the training, it, it gave me the path of where I am now, where I became more of a holistic health coach, like one-on-one. I don't need as much space. Um, gym ownership, the idea of having that space that I'm selling, uh, it was really hard to change the identity from what I'm teaching to you're not buying me, you're buying the gym, right? You're renting the gym essentially. But I, it was really hard to separate myself from that process. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So like the product's different, like now you're the product, you know, or the, that's what they're getting is, is your expertise. And I was still doing that even at the gym and it was, I just couldn't separate it. Even though I really tried hard to like create that separation. Um, but since I was so hands-on with it, um, the only way that it would have worked is if I had hired a manager and stepped away. So that way that manager and the gym became the vision of that space. But I just couldn't ha- didn't have enough money to, at that time, to be able to hire somebody to, to hold that space like I was so I could walk away from it. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a really good learning process. But, hey, you know, it's, it's working out. And so that was, that was very recently that you finally closed the gym down. Uh, so that was the gym closed down was about, I guess, five years ago. Mm, okay. Yeah. And then I opened a holistic health coaching center, a wellness center out in Westlake. Is and that your shirt that you're wearing there? Is yeah. Is that your company? Austin Holistic Fitness and mm-hmm. Nutrition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's was a studio with like eight different people and they had all kinds of different, or I had all kinds of different uh, modalities, acupuncture, um, Let's see, ashiatsu massage, different massage therapists, uh, different modes of healing, nutrition. So it's it's a similar business. It's a different take on it, but like you still use the physical space. You operated out of a physical space. I did, mm-hmm. but with a different vision of like singular coaches doing things, uh, and it was just a different way of like helping people and healing people, uh, because the idea of just selling the gym itself for you know forty eight dollars a month wasn't really a we really wasn't a go at it. I see what you're saying. Yeah. But then that didn't work for me because I was still holding that business space. I was still doing most of the work to that space didn't get that could still couldn't change the identity and people were still coming for me and not necessarily the space itself and what they're going to get from the space when they come there for healing. And well, I just uh, relaxed into that and leaned into that, that truth and said, okay, well, if this is what the world wants, is they need me to be that person that holds that space, then fine. So I closed that space down with all those different rooms and went to one room and then just kind of started doing it on my own. And I mean, I essentially, once I really settled into that truth of it, I almost quadrupled my, my profits. Oh, that's awesome. And then you needed less space to do so. Yeah. Needed less space, less overhead increased my own price. I uh, was able to market and brand a little bit easier since it wasn't so confusing that, you know, what do I actually do? Am I a gym owning space or do I actually do the coaching myself? 
and people are, are less confused about what I do. And here we go. So what would you, what do you do? Like what's you'd say the best ways in which you help people? Right now it's education mm-hmm. with, mixed with experience. So holistic health coaching, which is more of a new term for a lot of people, which is that. Yeah, I'm not really, I'm surprised. I'm not really familiar with it. I mean, I understand the words put together, but I hadn't heard of it. The holistic health coaching is going to be more looking at a person's whole not just their fitness in the sense of physicality, but their fitness mentally, their fitness spiritually, and what those things can look like through a program that allows you to level up. How you can do a holistic health coaching program from person to person can be, where do you start at? Do you start with the spiritual? Do you start with the mind? Do you start with the emotions? Do you start with the food and the physical aspects? Each person's ready for a different start start point. And for me, I just really push on the idea of start points is when people are ready for physical changes. And then I work with them from that readiness point. And from there, they still have to walk through those gates of change when it comes to mind, body, and spirit to be able to make those physical changes actually happen. So do you help them with their diet as well? I start with diet, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, if you wanted me to go over what the eight week program and that I do looks like, or I don't, what's sure, sure, mm-hmm. I'm interested in those things. Uh, so since I've taken the the process of moving all that space from this really grand moment of owning a gym, that all this space and all this energy, and then really bringing it down to a small space, it's hyper focused on uh, your health, which is the eight week program. Uh, The first week we do all fruits and vegetables and the second week we do adding in proteins and starches and the third week we add in nuts and oils and the fourth week we add in some fitness and posture for digestion. What does posture for digestion mean? Just like literally your posture, how how you... Yeah, yeah. because if you're sitting, you know, in a bad position, I say bad position, in a relaxed position, then you can actually, it's a lymphatic system, it's a plumbing system, you can pinch and crimp things. And so you actually can lose some of that flow, that fluidity with your inside your body and your um, cardiovascular system and your plumbing system, your intestines and stuff like that as well. So if we can kind of open that up, it actually helps a lot with being able to rest and digest uh, because sitting in a kind of a slump position where your body is holding on for dear life is not actually a real rest position. That makes sense. And so we work from that space. But each of those things, week five and six are adding in grains and seeing how those grains are affecting or not affecting the body. Um, Yeah, because some people can be sensitive to grains, right? And some not. Yeah, so that's why you start and you you introduce things as you move on, and then if you see something that's not working for that person, then remove it? That's kind of the the base level aspect of what I am looking at, yes. Uh, There is also so many, that's the more of the physical aspect. So if we look at the mind and the, the spirit aspect of it, you're also working through the the physicality is like I feel better from doing eating fruits and vegetables and not eating like a lot of sugar and caffeine and other things that might be desensitizing your body. It gets you back in your body, more spirit aspect of it. I can feel my body more. Awesome. There's an opening right there. Their mind is like doing something consistently with some type of discipline for a week takes a lot of effort to understand your mental like why you don't or do want to do those things doing anything that's simple consistently in a very complex day in a complex world takes some really some digging in and so not only they are they working on the physical aspect of how food is actually affecting them just being able to do that mentally is something that you do for seven days as well Mm -hmm. and that's very rewarding if they're able to stick to it For themselves. Yeah, it gives them like more confidence and stuff like that. Their experience, and we talked a little bit earlier about education and experience being a holistic program that I teach. I don't want people just to come to an eight-hour seminar or eight sessions or like my eight-week program and hear a bunch of information and leave with no application or experience from that. And so I had to figure a way to split that up so that way people can hear the education, experience it, and that way... I'm not just telling them how they're going to feel or how they should feel or what the expectations of doing those things are. So it's not a pass fail for them. 
they actually can integrate it and know what's good for their body in that right as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just a huge eye opening for understanding food and how it's affecting each person individually without expecting that the science says that if I do this one thing, that your body should be doing this thing. Nutrition is still very confusing in that, right? Yeah. There's so much, there's many different ways to go about it. And what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. And why is still kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so until we have a greater understanding of the gut microbes and what is a standardization of food and what we should or shouldn't be doing, there's some base level things that humans kind of have to do to be humans. Are there any particular things that you would feel comfortable recommending just across the board that someone do like uh, take a probiotic, uh, any, any supplements, any things that you think that, that people should do every day uh, for supplementations, not necessarily right off the bat because each person, once you start eating fruits and vegetables just daily, if you find out that your body can't digest for some reason fruits or vegetables, what then we need to really figure out why the body can't do a human thing. Your body should be able to digest fruits and vegetables. It, just, sure. it should. Yeah. Why it's not is something that we have to look at. And then we would put in a supplementation such as like, like a probiotic or enzymes to help break things down. Mm -hmm. uh, so realistically, the thing that I would say as a recommendation is eat more vegetables and fruit. Uh, well, my program is unlimited vegetables and only two fruits a day. How much meat do you eat? Per meal, about four to five ounces. And so per day, probably around mm, 10 to 15% of my day would be animal products. Mm -hmm. This week, I'm actually eating none. Why uh, is that? You just cycle it sometimes? I'm actually doing my own program. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I actually cycle through <clears throat> my program two or three times a year <clears throat> uh, to make sure that my body stays in a really very comfortable position with inflammation. And also sometimes I'm eating way too much animal products or it's just too much caffeine and just not enough water. And I find my own habits start wavering when I get busy. Mm. So to be able to do the same program and focus on doing one thing each day several times in a very complex world where I'm doing many things, it does good for my mind, body, and spirit as well. Not just hyper-focusing on it being a, a reaction or a knee-jerk reaction to, well, I wasn't healthy this weekend physically, so I'm going to do something that makes me feel physically better. It's, that's only working in that one of those realms. Yeah. And so I, I do it because it's a conscious effort to see where my mind, body, and spirit are at by doing something consistently enough to know, have some data. Yeah. So do you do any meditation when it comes to the mind, body, and spirit part of it? What, what does that look like? Meditation itself? Um, well, the mind, body, spirit part of, or the, the spirit and mind part of the program, I guess. Um, there are parts that, you, that happen to you anyways by just trying to follow the schematics of the, of the program itself. Those are kind of the things that you, epiphanies, the aha moments that come about spiritually, mind, body, and spirit along the way. There are some practices that you can consciously do to actually improve on that, um, which is going to be like meditation, actually practicing some meditation. Those things happen to you anyways throughout the program, uh, but to what my personal practice is would be actually sound baths. So um, okay. actually, do you know what a sound bath is? No, I don't. It, take those big bowls that are metal or crystal and you rub that uh, mallet around the edge of them and okay, it makes the sounds. That. And I have a, a good collection of those at my space in my house. And so for me to sit and listen to those bowls for me helps to relax my mind. That's really cool. I kind of want one of those bowls now. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does seem fun. And since I come from a logic place, remember I was a teacher, right? So there's a lot of logic that comes from book work and memorizing books and also this place of spirituality emotions things that are kind of hard much harder and more infinite to be able to try and contain the, that don't have a lot of logic to them sometimes because feelings tend to be illogical mm -hmm. and so what's great about the bowls that i that i find myself using my logical brain for is that it's there's a lot of good science that shows the Cortisol, which is that stress hormone, when you feel stress, you have cortisol, 
begins to move through your body and then you have adrenaline and stuff like that that comes as a um as a reaction to that cortisol and so the sound bath actually relaxes the brain and actually where the cortisol is being created helps to bring it down and so when i'm playing those bowls for somebody else or even myself i can actually feel a sense of relaxation but also i kind of know that that science matches with what it's actually happening physically in my body. And for me, that's the perfect balance. Mm -hmm. Where do you get one of those bowls? You just get on Amazon or something? I get mine off eBay, yeah. eBay? Okay. Yeah. 200 bucks for a nice giant one. Or you can... I've actually ordered some off Alibaba mm -hmm. up from overseas from, from Tibet. Yeah. So the Tibetan singing bowls. Cool. And uh, yeah, they came out. They came great. Super easy. And then, but the practice of doing that, if it feels good, you'll continue to do it because it feels good. And that's good for your body. The word is inherently what is good for you and feels good. And if you take any path of using an app for, um, for, your, for your mind, body, spirit to be able to relax and meditate and feel good, um, one giant mind, uh, calm, any of them that you're able to sit and be consciously trying to relax, then you're going to get a, a benefit from it as mm -hmm. well. What kind of clients do you see coming your way? Are they people that are fairly fit already and want to step it up? Or are they people that um, are trying to make a huge change? It's a, it's a bit all over the place. I mean, I've got right now clients that are 23 um, and looking to just reestablish understanding health after college. I've got people that are in their 45, 50 year old range that are looking for weight loss. They've got people that are looking for general, just I, they don't know much about food and they want a better relationship to food. The, the readiness there is that they are a bit tired of seeing all of the information in this world that is confusing and conflicting. And they're looking for some type of guidance that will allow them to be able to kind of know what to do. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, in my, I hold that space for myself to know that like, I can't tell each person exactly what to do. We talked about that already. It's like, it's, it's the science can say one thing, but your body's reaction to it. So guiding people through the program gives me enough time and space to be able to know how, their body is going to change and react to that. And that feels good. Yeah. So, and we kind of covered it, but I'm not super clear. So this business sounds like you don't need a physical space to do it. So are you no longer operating out of a physical space at all? No, I'd have a small office over mm -hmm. in Westlake still. Mm -hmm. um, it does, it does better for Yelp and Google and to be seen and people to be able to collect stories. And, and if you see my Google Yelp reviews, it's, beautiful stories of people's experiences and not much about me. Austin holistic fitness. Yeah. Nutrition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now it sounds like this is a little more protected from COVID than say a gym, mm -hmm. but still was when COVID hit, was that causing issue with you? Cause I feel like you only need to be with one person at a time. It was a lot easier. I wasn't hit as much as if I had a gym, like I would have been hit a lot harder, but because I can do things remotely, and I can see people through Zoom and still be able to get very similar results, then, yeah, it was a lot easier for me. But the personality of the world changed so much at that moment that everyone was more, um, I guess, cautious to be able to spend as much money as my program might cost for a normal person. Yeah. And so, and it became, I say normal person, we're all normal. Um, it became a little bit harder to be able to reach you because everyone was being cautious and everyone was staying home. And, and not many people were really looking at their health as, as something that can help them with the immunity to COVID and understanding that eating well could help them with COVID. But they absolutely should. They absolutely should. Mm -hmm. I'll hold that. I'll say that as a, as a fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, our immune system will help us with all of those things. And it took it a little while. It took it a few months uh, because people realized that one, it wasn't going away and they've now had time being home to actually work on their uh, physical bodies and working on their physical bodies is actually going to be useful that to be able to help with 
COVID or any other sickness in general. And it was a great watch to see people not being in a place where they were knee jerk reacting to like, well, I've gained 15 pounds. Now I need to lose weight. But a lot of people were, were have been coming to me more of like this sense of, I want to protect my body. I want strong immune system. I want to understand things. I realized that while I was at home and I wasn't able to get food out at restaurants all the time that I didn't know how to cook very well and I didn't have a relationship to food. Great. My program will help you with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was really a, a great thing to see and feel that personality of that because I was more uh, reluctant to continue the business the way I was doing if everyone is just trying to come back and lose the 15 pounds that they gained but they didn't really care about the relationship they were having to their environment and their well-being and so that was a really cool kind of nuance that I saw happening mm -hmm. it's still happening yeah and so when COVID first hit you started making these um, what would you call this type of necklace it's called wire wrapping wire wrapping mm -hmm. yeah some of the the hippie things that I do you know once yeah. you start diving into mind body spirit you get a little bit hippie in a way because yeah. it's just part of the game I think it's part of Austin I, I'm totally cool with hippie stuff mm-hmm I mean, I joke around about hippie bullshit sometimes, but I'm kidding. Like, I, I like hippies. I mean, even I'll say things are like kind of like woo woo in a way because yeah. some things are like totally like in a in a headspace. But I say with like a term of endearment, then more that it's like a negative thing. Yeah, and that's okay. I'm changing that kind of uh, narrative around it, and <clears throat> it's just art. You know, it's that creativity that understanding that like the feelings and emotions that can be in flow state or be creative. These are things that are like woo woo or hippie, but everyone does it in their own way. And there's science behind flow state. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so these became a part of like how I actually found um, some stability at the beginning of the, of the, of the pandemic of mm -hmm. the COVID when it first went in lockdown, you know, my, uh, my structure and my understanding and like my day to day was, is my eight week program. Mm -hmm. But since that kind of really kind of went silent for a few weeks, you know, during that real, that first part of that lockdown, um, it opened up a lot more space for what you we could say for flow state. Cause my structure for my day to day was kind of like disassembled. Yeah. And so I just let myself do that. And so I found this structure by doing a day-to-day -day that was in that flow state of creating these wire wrapping pieces and just channeled that entrepreneurship that I already have in my body to be able to create businesses and be able to shift and be dynamic. It's a mindset thing that it's very powerful and useful where, um, you know, it's like if you need to make some money, people that have that mindset don't get too scared. They'll come up with something or come up with some way to, to bring in some extra money. And yeah, I think it's uh, something that more people should keep in mind. There's a balance there that is, we can talk about with, with just like the sense of purpose, right? Uh, the need for structure and also not being afraid to sell your art for a reasonable price because you know that you also need it and being okay with saying, I need this amount for to do this thing and this is just the way it is and then putting it out into the world and then watching what happens. Mm -hmm. Here's a interesting balance between all those things yeah and so i'm practiced in the uh, in the selling myself already and being able to like here's this art that i've created this is how much it costs i know how much i need to be able to continually do this thing and make more stuff for other people and then i fell into a space that people were okay with that price looks like you do a good job that looks good thanks yeah it does help that i'm good at it <laughs> <laughs> it does help that i'm good at it <laughs> <laughs> and so like I have a, a brain that, that kind of breaks things down in a, in a way that um, I don't necessarily get frustrated uh, when I can't do something perfectly the right the first time, as long as others allow me space to keep learning. And so in that space, the only person that would have kept me from learning was myself. <laughs> and so when I make something and I just, it looked all mangled, put it down, do it again, looked a little bit less mangled, put it down, do it again. And after a week of doing that, I mean, I already had enough skills in my body to then a base level to be able to transform and do that from there. And thankfully, also people liked it. Yeah. Because I'm not afraid of showing it to people. 
some of the things that I thought I were like, this is this is something that is not super great. I throw it out there anyways, and not really trying to worry so much about how how it was received by people's judgments. And it turned out that people loved it. Mm-hmm. So I hope that people can take away from that part of the story that they can feel motivated to put their art out, out into the world so people can see it no matter what state they think it is. Because there is no perfect with art. Agreed. And you got to just get started too. Just, yeah. And then see how it goes from there. Also, I realized that people wanted, Mm -hmm. you know, people were like, oh, can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? Like, oh, I see you can do that. Can you do this for me? And then I started to really able to kind of uh, figure out what path I was going to make and what I I was going to make based off people's requests. And so it just kind of went from there as well, which helps with the entrepreneurship because people are actually asking me for things as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that does help. So um, I, one thing I want to ask you about is uh, your acro yoga. You post a lot of photos on Facebook and you see, you've been doing that for a while and it looks like you're really good at it. You get some really crazy poses. What got you into acro and, and how long actually have you been doing it? Yeah, the, the pillars of, of my life kind of right now work around my job, my eight-week program. Uh, the wire wrapping, which keeps me doing art. And, and how do you sell state. those? Just word of mouth or do you have a website for those? I just word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. People see me on Instagram. They're on my Instagram, Jeremy fit ATX, Jeremy fit ATX. Yeah. yeah. And, or my, my Facebook, usually just the Instagram is going to be a great place to look. Mm-hmm. And then people buy them from there mm-hmm. or they were, they'll send me stones and then do that. That's the other pillar of sanity that I work with that sense of purpose to, to continue my day to day. And and then the the other third major pillar of of purpose that I work in that I've also I go deep like I want to understand the dynamics of of, of that activity so much that I I hyper focus on those these three pillars on a day to day, and it feels really good for me to do that because um, that way I'm just not spread all over the place and and so the acro yoga has become that other pillar which is. So much of all the movements I've ever done in my life with Olympic powerlifting and understanding um, uh, just fitness and personal training and boot camp training and doing my own fitness stuff and Camp Gladiator and all kinds of things just coexists in this uh, movement practice when you're with another person that has all those strength dynamics. I mean, it just goes it's unlimited what you can do with the human body and shapes and options to be able to dance. Mm-hmm. And it feels really good in that. I started it with a, a blind date. Oh, really? Yeah. I went on a blind date and, um, I had never been to an acro jam and I'd never met her. And so we met there and then we dated for three months and then, um, she wanted me to not do the acro anymore because she didn't feel comfortable with, I was working, I guess, with other women and other men. Doing it is pretty close physical contact. It looks strange to, to people. And you, <laughs> and you recently put some pictures up on Facebook where y'all are naked, but you can't see anything, obviously, because otherwise Facebook would have taken it down. I thought those were really cool. It's part of that practice that I didn't even really realize I was going to get to that level of being able to make beautiful shapes. Uh, but my partner trusts me. Um, I trust myself. I trust my partner. And I trust the photographer as well. It's a, just a series of trust. I also trust that the world was ready to see those pictures. Mm-hmm. I also trust that the people that were around me that were on my Facebook were going to receive that in a, in a positive light. And uh, it was nerve-wracking to share those things because you, you don't know what's going to happen. I, I bet it was. I, like I said, I thought it was super cool, you know, because you're really good at it. And I didn't see it as any kind of negative thing to be sharing those um i just thought it was like that's it's really artistic it's cool yeah the art is art is interesting like that right art Mm -hmm. can be is a a part of that flow state that is channeling the illogical mind the emotions and so what comes out is sometimes not built in some perfection or logic and so as you throw it out to the world people who receive that that art sometimes can be an illogical emotional reaction Great. <laughs> and some, but sometimes that can be pretty intense mm-hmm. and, and it can be considered like as negative in a way. Uh, but thankfully, Acro has helped a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it looks strange to people because we're, you know, doing these 
or holding people up in the air, but to be able to do those activities takes a tremendous amount of knowledge in your body and uh, strength. A lot of balance in all different ways too. Mind, body, spirit. Yeah. And so it's a collection of all my experiences that allow me to be able to do those things in, um, in a way that it, it did not just works on the physical, like, oh, I feel strong, but also I feel trust and connection. And there's a mental game that you play to be able to puzzle pieces with the human body. Yeah, I want to go back to this blind date. So you, you go on this blind date and you you pre-agreed to meet at this acro gym. Yeah. You go, you meet her, you guys do some acro. You've never done it before. She shows you some. Uh, no, no, there's people there at the gym that showed us how to do things. Okay, as a team together, they're like, they're starting to help you sh- make some poses. The community is nice in that in that realm that if you're new and you're showing up, there's always people that will be like, hey, let me show you how to fly on feet. And you're like, what is flying on feet? Mm-hmm. And they're like, this is flying on feet. And then you <laughs> kind of either find that interest in flying on feet and understanding what that is, um, or you don't. Mm-hmm. I just happened to find that interest and she didn't find that interest. And so, um, she asked me to stop and I said, no, mm-hmm. no, thank you. And, and so I kept the acro. <laughs> you kept the acro no yeah. longer seeing her. No, that's been many years ago. Mm-hmm. That's probably been five years ago. Do you have a girlfriend now? I do. Mm-hmm. Is it the girl that you were doing the poses with? No, that's my other partner, acro partner. Her mm-hmm. name's Jordan mm-hmm. and she's great. So part of that's the, the strangeness that people see, right? Mm-hmm. Is like your girlfriend's comfortable with that. She loves it. Mm-hmm. She knows and trusts that, like we're doing these amazing things. That that <clears throat> we're it's not just us posing naked together mm-hmm. because we're doing something that takes such a, a a massive amount of skill and mind and spirit to be able to do that. You trust yourself enough that somebody else like literally is able to trust you as well Mm -hmm. and they trust their own emotions around that how many times has someone fallen on top of you it's a good question (laughs) uh you've never been injured from it i have i have been injured once actually over all all the years and that was kind of like my first year of Mm -hmm. doing it and it was a lesson learned was it a bad injury or just a minor bump Broke a couple of ribs broke a couple where someone fell and she, a couple yeah, of ribs. She, she came backwards and hit me in the ribs and uh was it my fault was it her fault it wasn't there's not really a, a, a name game you know blame there yeah i'm sure there's not i mean you, you're you're practicing something together mistakes happen mistakes happen the biggest mistake was that it was at the end of like an like an 18 hour weekend of doing acro of a festival and it was like the last 30 minutes of it just not checking in on am i exhausted is my nervous system able to do this move i didn't even know what questions to ask myself yet Mm -hmm. um but thankfully going through the negative experiences like that where uh somebody she she got her you know her head hurt for a little bit my ribs got broke we both healed thankfully it wasn't worse and we're able to heal from that process but also take those lessons that's a very lucky very good place to be and so um i feel fortunate that no one was hurt and do they happen? Does it happen often? No. You'd say it's fairly safe. Every physical movement practice is going to have some inherent risks risks to it. And so, but if you do anything without a coach, your risks then go up. True. So uh, I spent a lot of time with coaches after that, really learning how to do the practice. And then everything became a lot safer and a lot more coordinated and understood. Um, I would say that's the biggest thing is a lot of people just don't get coaches in acro or any practice in a way and their risks then kind of go through the roof. Yeah. You want to have the proper technique. You want to do it right. Make sure someone experience has gotten you through it. Yeah. And it's been a man, it's been great. I mean, you see my Facebook, but that's not my business. People Mm -hmm. that like, if you see me on Google and Yelp, the way I've branded myself as an entrepreneur in that space, you'll never see the acro there. It's very contained. And it's contained for a reason because not everyone wants to know that I'm holding naked people in the air. (laughs) Uh, And also they're sitting with me and I'm teaching them about nutrition. Yeah. It's a little bit too all over the place. And so as an entrepreneur, I've hyper-focused those different spaces, those containers to be what exists in those spaces. Mm -hmm. So it works really well. Yeah. So earlier we were talking about, I didn't know that you're building a house right now. Is it done? It's done. Okay, and so you were building the house, then COVID hit. Wasn't that scary? <laughs> it became a lot easier uh, because my business is somewhat mobile, so I could still see my 
clients online, that was really helpful. Yes, building a house during COVID was mind-bogglingly weird. It kind of, I have to kind of like slow it down a little bit, even when I think about it, because the house was only half done in February. And so to get the workers out to that space to actually do the work Mm -hmm. was incredibly, was incredibly difficult. Okay. There was obviously the fear of COVID itself because no one knew what was going on. Yeah. I mean, And so there was no information yet. And so we didn't know if it was going to, you know, in the world at that point. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's crazy to think about. And so I was, I had an RV in my backyard that I put as a guest house and hooked it all up. And I was like watching this house from, you know, 90 feet away and just like looking at it every day going, this is a very strange life to live right now. I'm living in an RV making wire wrap jewelry while the house is like half done. And I'm just sitting there like in this surreal moment of like, what in the heck? And it, uh, but it kept going. Mm-hmm. It just, it kept going. Thankfully, my sense of purpose for doing the wire wrapping kept me in a space where I felt okay. It was great that you did that. Um, that you, I mean, since, you know, COVID had hit, your house isn't complete. Um, we don't know what the world's going to be like. You're like, you know what? I'm just going to start making these wire wrappings. I felt the need to do something. And I hope that everyone at that time found their, sense to 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 shift and adapt or in, and then work that energy that they would normally be putting toward their daily life routines and not just thinking that it's just open space and they don't know what to do but finding something else to do i mean some of the most amazing art has come from a lot of pandemics across the the centuries yeah you know <laughs> and then just crazy shit happened in the renaissance everything else um and so yeah the house now is done Cool, man. You it, like it? It's beautiful. It. Where in town are you? South Austin. South so Austin? South, like South Lamar. Mm-hmm. Cool. It's, in, um, it's been a, a heck of a ride. I appreciate that it's been difficult because there's a lot of lessons to learn there, but also, dang, I wish it hadn't been so difficult. <laughs> How long did it take to finish it? It's supposed to take three months, but it actually ended up taking seven months. Yeah. Mostly probably because of COVID and it slowed down the work or just because t- you know, things take longer than people say they will. I'll be honest. The, because of COVID, I had to pick workers that were willing to work. And so I wasn't able to pick the best workers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just wasn't. But you like how it turned out? Uh, yes. After the COVID started to, the pandemic aspect started to kind of calm down a little bit. Some of the other workers out there um, that were a little higher, higher quality started to show back up again. I'm not really sure why that all is, but um, they started to show up and became more available. And then the house got done pretty quickly Mm -hmm. and overcame some of the problems. And yeah, it's fantastic. You live with your girlfriend? No, I live alone. Mm -hmm. How long have you guys been together? I guess three months. Three months. Okay. So it's, yeah, that's, you don't live together yet. No, uh, Mm -hmm. it's a great partnership. The partnership is the a part of like relationships to everything is kind of like what I teach relationship to food, relationship to movement, relationship to meditation. What is your relationship to those things? And then changing the narrative around that relationship. Mm-hmm. So that way it feels good. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, she supports so much in those relationships with other people and movements and other things as well, which helps our relationship between each other. We can hear and speak and feel open and, and understand each other mm-hmm. without mm, much limitations of where our mind is going. Mm-hmm. And so it's great. Cool. Thanks for asking about that. Yeah. Yeah. So do you drink at all? Are you real strict with your diet or are you? I drink. You drink. Yeah. Every now and then. Mm-hmm. Not, uh, not too often. Um, I would never really drink more than two drinks mm-hmm. if I were to. Uh, right now. I wish I could do that. <laughs> well, my body's sensitive yeah. just inherently from eating well and the movement practices that I have that, that force you to understand your internal workings, your internal dialogue, grounding with your feet, uh, the mental aspects of it. You're forced inside your body so much that alcohol then you can tell when your body is like not really on its on its point. I can see what you're saying when it comes to that. I mean, you're used to a lot of balance, a lot of physical exercise. And then if you start to get a little buzz, you can. You can feel that difference that off balance real fast. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 
what kind of exercising do you do? Do you get most of your exercise just from doing the things you like, like acro, or do you lift weights? Do you? I, I lift weights for physical therapy um, and for just like tempering my body. Mm -hmm. um, it does help that like right now I'm on like a 40 day no drinking because my friend asked me to do it with them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So like I don't have a problem with like exiting that stuff. What's great is like when I'm not drinking and I'm doing it for a little while, uh, my body starts to call to doing some more weightlifting itself. Uh, but most of my exercise is just calisthenics. I mean, you see, I do handstands like all the time. Mm -hmm. The handstand itself is not the exercise. The exercise is to be able to do a handstand is incredibly powerful teaching your body how to move and how to feel well, which mm -hmm. is awesome. I recommend everyone do that. Yeah. <laughs> They don't have to do a handstand. They just do the handstand journey. I've tried. I've tried doing handstands for a bit up against the wall and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I got okay at it and I could eventually hold it a little bit, but I stopped doing it. I should start doing it again. It's kind of fun. That is, that's the human puzzle part of it. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to do a handstand to, to enjoy the, the journey. It's like, I'm going to climb this mountain right now. And it's like, well, I mean, you got to walk to the mountain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Understand where your feet are at, what gear that you need, you know, think about the process and enjoy that part of it as well. And that's when your body then begins to change and you understand what your body needs to then be able to climb the mountain. Yeah. So what are your, what are you doing to keep yourself entertained outside of work now with COVID? I mean, obviously all of our routines and our circles for hanging out are different now, you know? You talk about with friends? Yeah, with friends. I think I'm doing mostly what everyone's doing is the quarantines. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a... a quarantines? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you have your eight or nine people that you interact with, and they also, have, you have trust that they are interacting with similar people, like, you're within that group. And Same. They're cautious. They they feel like it actually exists. Like, I don't want to hang out with people, personally, who uh, say that it's it's fake or it's false or it doesn't exist. Yeah, then I, I feel like they're not taking care of themselves in a way that I can feel comfortable right now. Um, am I right or wrong? I, I don't know anymore. I mean, it's all really confusing. I'm just doing the best I can with uh, being able to just take care of myself and my clients. Yeah, I think it comes down to personal choice and just at least being somewhat cautious. Like you said, I, I'm totally comfortable with hanging out with a small group of the same people. Just mm -hmm. like you said, I, I, there's two things I do. I either go to my friend Derek's or I go to KP's and, and hang at the pool outside and chlorine, you know, it's basically my two go-tos for the, for the summer until all this passes, which mm. I'm sure probably won't pass till sometime next year. But yeah, I mean, and some people can cr criticize and I, I say, do what makes you feel comfortable. If you don't want to be around people, don't, don't be around people, but I don't think you should criticize people that hang out in small groups, you know? Uh, yeah. I, I see a lot of, of, uh, you know, hating on people who are wearing a mask in their car. We don't know why they're wearing a mask in their car. <laughs> I mean, I have a friend that, that runs that runs groceries to older and elderly people. And so he doesn't want to be like in the car with those things, like breathing on them and then bring them in. Is that the right or wrong decision? I, I, I mean, the science is all over yeah, the place. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Choosing any choice. And so people just need to quit dogging on other people right now. Like, there's like, let them do what they want as long as it's not hurting you and it's not changing things for you. It's like, you, you know what I mean? I agree. Um, but also honor that, uh, that it does exist. Yeah, it definitely exists. I mean, I know people that have gotten it, so <laughs> it's real. Yeah. On a heavies part of that, my friend, my friend, uh, Bella, she passed, um, in March from COVID and she's my age and she's healthy mm. and what's happened? Well, obviously was healthy. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was, uh, kind of nerve wracking because it just puts everything into that reality. You know, two yeah. of my family members have passed from it and two so, of your family members. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's a real, it's a real thing in that sense. Um, and then people that try to, when I put it online and people try to argue with me that it wasn't actually that and this and that it just, um, yeah, it's just all over the place and it's emotionally taxing. I'm sure, man. I'm sorry to hear that by the way. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. It's uh it's it's a lot to to hold on to the the confusion of what it could or couldn't like couldn't be at this point. I just wish that there was some more definitive understanding. Um, we all do. 
It's crazy how little, I feel like we still don't know that much. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, we'll get there. But right now, um, honestly, things feel like my day-to-day entertaining is pretty comfortable in the sense of I hold to that space. I do my work. I have my pillars that, of purpose, which is my, my business, my week program, my wire wrapping, my acro yoga, which thankfully my partner is also kind of a part of those pillars as well. And so, um, you know, the cultivating the relationship between us is not necessarily it's just its own definitive pillar. It feels like we're both kind of doing similar things. And so we're kind of intertwining with those pillars. And so it feels really good. I don't know if that made sense. No, it did make sense. It, yeah. I mean, you know, we're, you're, you're settled into your COVID life, you know, and mm-hmm. this is how you're going about it and you're going about it in a healthy way. I mean, I think that's important. It's like, yeah, things have changed, but as long as, you know, it's like settle into the way things are and make sure that you're maintaining your happiness despite our limited options, mm. our new reality. The new reality for now, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's almost, it, I don't even know it from day to day what it's, what it's, I forget that, like, I can't go to certain restaurants or there's like movies that like I don't go see. Like, I've totally actually forgot that, like, I haven't been to a bar or a movie theater in yeah. like eight months. Yeah, I was going to fly to, I'm taking vacation this Friday. I'm going to Kentucky. My family lives in Indiana, but we meet in Kentucky. They rent out um, a house on a lake and we mm-hmm. go boating for the week. I was going to fly to Indiana and I just really didn't want to fly, but I don't want to drive because it's 16 hours. I, I ended up, I'm going to drive, but yeah, it's just kind of another one of those things. It's like, do I drive 16 hours or do I get on this three hour flight? It would be a lot easier, but. Yeah, travel. That's, uh, I miss going to California. I mean, I haven't been to California and there's a lot of people, there's 50, 50, 50% of the people say I shouldn't be scared and I should go do it. And then 50% that say that you're making a good decision. It's like, I don't really know what to do here except for like you're if you don't get sick you're right if you do get sick you weren't right (laughs) yeah oh my gosh (laughs) makes my head spin there Uh, and so yeah I miss the travel Um, out in California there's a a really beautiful um, collection of people doing high level skill acrobatics and being able to just be around them Mm. So, yeah, that's part of the reason why you want to go out there. Yeah, they're also just to be at that level as well. They also have a lot of internal dialogue that allows them to be able to be a great coach as well. And it's great to be able to get coached by them and just be around that and hear them talk to each other. Mm -hmm. It's just a great community. You've been around great communities. Yeah, I mean, the burn community. Yeah, you could you can call a bit of those people in, in that sense, they go to, to the burn burns as well. I can see those two communities intermixing. It does. Uh, last night I was actually with some, my corn team and we were uh, doing some fire staff and I had like fire nunchucks. Oh, I saw you were spinning. So like it's called poi, right? I mean, whether it's fire or not, it's still called poi. Is it not? I think so. Uh-huh. I think that any uh, mechanism that you're spinning around is considered a poi, mm-hmm. uh, but they're all they're called different types of poi. Mm-hmm. I think that's correct. And so, had you ever practiced it before, or did you just pick up and someone showed you? So, uh, <laughs> my uh, my roommate in college was a uh, a uh, black belt, and when I was a freshman in college in the dorms, and he had some nunchucks, and I've always wanted to learn nunchucks, and so he showed me how to use nunchucks. Yeah, and so I. Sp- how I work because I obsessively took those nunchucks for like two hours a day for a week and then figured out the basics. And then 15 years later, I, someone dropped off some fire nunchucks at my house last week. And I was like, Oh cool. So last night I've actually never spun fire before, but I knew how to use these nunchucks Mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, last night I was like, all right, let's set them on fire. And because of my practice and just how I know my body, I was like able to really do some really great, cool stuff and not get hurt. And that was a great experience. And the, they're part of the burn community, uh, but they also are part of a movement community as well. People, what, what's a movement community? What do you mean? People that just like to be able to move their body. Oh, move little physical movement. Okay. Yeah, like the physical movement. Now, mm-hmm. there's all kinds of movements in the world. Mm-hmm. We can talk about those as well. But like the movement aspect of the physical movement world, being able to uh, do lira and aerials and silks where you're like hanging from the sky and like performers. Silks are really cool. Yeah. And so a lot, the burn community uh, attracts performers in that right. That's true. They do. 
Wonder Lounge does the silts every year at Flipside. Mm-hmm. We're about at an hour. Is there anything else you want to talk about? We can just go on forever. Just random stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just appreciate you bringing me on here and just hearing my story. Uh, you know about, about Austin Holistic Fitness and Nutrition, wire wrapping. You know the the idea of acro yoga, and these are things that like I also coach people in as well. So if people ever want to reach out to me and understand a little bit more of the relationship that I have to those pillars mm-hmm. and how that's kind of changed my life. I'm happy to talk more about those stories, especially if people are interested in taking that path themselves. And that's on Instagram, Jeremy fit ATX. Uh, that's that or Austin holistic fitness on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, and also Austin holistic fitness.com, which is my website. So if like people's interest, I'm a, I'm a coach. That's who I am. That's what I do. And I accept that role in this world. But we're all coaches in a way. Every, you know, we, you knowing things about your awesome projector that you have, I don't know much about. I would come to you and be like, how do I do this? Yeah, yeah. And then you might be able to coach me in that process. And so it's, uh, we're all coaches in that realm. And I just kind of settled into that role of a way that um, I make a living as well. And so if people are interested in any, each of those pillars, I'm able to really give some good information on how they can do that themselves. And that's how I want to move in this world is, is to, is to motivate and also inspire people to uh, be able to do that themselves. If they're like, Oh wow, I've never been able to do that before. I'd never think I would. I just want people to be able to have a chance to change that narrative, change that story. So that way they feel like they can do the opposite of the things that they say that they can't do. For me, what I'm, what I'm hearing is that they're asked, they're actually want to, they just believe that they can't. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, man. And so, um, it's been a really great, so I guess that's, that kind of ties it all together in a way. Does. Perfect. Thanks for coming on, Jeremy. It was great. Uh, thanks for having me. All right. See you, thanks, man. Buddy. It was cool, man. I liked it a lot.